Wow. He's real. He's not just your friendly spring training camp, AJ Przinsky. Yeah, I mean, seriously. Thank you. I mean, do I get reimbursed for like gas money? I'm trying to figure this out. Like, do I, get, do I get gas money back? I mean, how about car washes? How about you all get the mileage. foods I have to stop and eat? You get mileage. Mileage is another great point. Another and a, great point. a really nice golf Not class. gas and mileage. Job. And how about, how about me trying to take care of all the interns? You know, like it's too windy. Hey, let's move over here. Well, there's, you know, the interns, no offense. I love them, but they're scared to like talk to the PR people. So mm -hmm. I'm like. Not only am I trying to get guys to do interviews, but I'm like, hey, can we move into this tent so we don't have a hurricane blowing? I'm going to let you Ex in on a little secret. You have more pull than most humans do in the game of baseball. <laughs> you can walk into a clubhouse or walk into the batting cage where Bryce Harper is hitting, and nobody's going to stop you, let alone interns. I worked in the sport for a long time. If I just hang out in the clubhouse where I'm not supposed to be there, someone's going to tap me on the shoulder and say, you're getting cut. No interns. I wasn't. I was. I followed the rules exactly to the letter yesterday. The lady was even making fun of me at the front desk of the Pirates. Why? Because the clubhouse didn't open until ten thirty, and like Rowdy says, "Hey, you can come in." And I'm like, "I don't know. It didn't open." Until... He's like, "Nah, just come in. Nobody will care." And I'm like, "Well, I'm going to follow the rules." This at nine thirty, so then it gets to ten thirty, and like it was like ten twenty six on the clock. She's like, "That clock's moving slow for you, isn't it?" I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> I'm like, can I just go in? No. Okay. Ten ten thirty. Okay, you can go in now. There was like four people in there. Okay, there dude, is listen. always a rule follower in every group, and I'm glad that AJ's a rule follower because yeah. with your baby blue, with your baby blue eyes and your very uh, stoic demeanor, you can be intimidating. So I'm glad that you're a rule follower and not a rule bender. There is, there is nothing, there is nothing that the pirates, the pirates are going to invite you back. So you did a great job of that. They don't want me down there. They know I'm going to create so much havoc because that's what I do. So that's why we sent you. You're the you're the foreign diplomat that we're sending in in case in case something happens. It was fun. Listen, I mean, I got to great. see a bunch of guys. I mean, would I go to ten camps? I think. Yeah. Nine Does it help you for your game prep this year? Of course, because like I don't know that I'm going to do a, I spoke I, to him. I don't know that I'm going to do a Pirates game this year. But at least I got to go in and talk to Shelton, Jared Jones. Maybe he pitches a game I do. I don't know. But I yeah. got to talk to him, right? Rowdy? I mean, I'm just going to bash him, so that's fine. He knows what's coming. <laughs> you know what the best part of yesterday was? And Rowdy hit on it, but it was so windy. I don't think you guys heard it. So, Mark, there was a couple guys I played with in the Pirates. Marty, uh, Martin Perez and then uh, Marco Gonzalez, who pitched yesterday. And so Rowdy was just talking shit, right, in the clubhouse. And Marco walks in, gives me a big hug. And, R and Rowdy's like, do you guys know each other? And I'm like, yeah, we played together 10 years ago. Right? He's like, he was a shit teammate. And Marco goes, no, actually, he was the one veteran that was nice to me. And Rowdy <laughs> was like, wait, what? And he's like, no way. What, how much did he pay you? And I was like, see, Rowdy, you're maybe wrong, but you do live in the Bay Area, Rowdy. And he's, and he just, and then he loses it you say that to him. <laughs> you got to Google that to understand what we're uh, talking about on that front. But that's good. I like that. Well, well played. And also... If you would like to join the FT Club membership on YouTube and use fun emojis and have some other perks, then you can do that. If you're looking on your screen, uh, you can press join. And then once you join, you can see press C perks. So check those out. Wait, do I have month. to pay for that too? I bought a subscription. I mean, do you have five AJ, AJ, I was talking to the interns this morning and not, and not one of the interns was complaining about like gas or mileage or like sunburn or wind or anything like that not i didn't hear one of them complaining yeah that's because they're still on mommy and daddy's payroll i'm not oh baseball reference forgot. says otherwise <laughs> <laughs> one more thing i forgot today is also the last day that our show begins at 11 a.m eastern time live until next like february 25th so the rest of Love the year, that. it's 1 o'clock Eastern time. Everybody gets their mornings back. Scotty sleeps in. He's going to be way less grumpy than he's been the last month. Sorry for that, yeah. FT fans. He will be less grumpy. He won't snap. I go from jack. three hours to, what, five hours of sleep. <laughs> Life's about to change. I'm going to be a nicer man. So let's charge the damn mound and go over the Shohei Otani press conference. Love it. So he addressed the media on Monday. No questions allowed. Wait, 
before we get into all of this too, no cameras or video footage allowed. I don't Wait, remember what? seeing that. They they made what? the announcement before he started saying no no video taken. Wow. Wasn't there video of it though? It, it was on MLB video. Network. Oh, that maybe that's the point. Like we're airing it exclusive. But I was like, really? They said like, please refrain from using video, something along those lines. I, I had not seen that before. For where did we get the video from? Because Fox conference. posted it. No, I'm I'm saying for you know writers and other media members that are sitting in there that maybe aren't a rights holder. Because gotcha. I guess this turned into a live event. I don't know when they cut in. I know that I was I was at my daughter's volleyball game. And uh, yeah, they cut in. On they the- cut in, and I got out, and I didn't get to watch it because my daughter was playing volleyball at the exact time. That so did you see what he said? I mean, I saw what he said. I mean, he basically read a statement. I mean, and then the interpreter interpreted it. But how do we know the interpreter interpreted it correctly? Well, because there's people because the last are- guy <laughs> might not have interpreted <laughs> everything correctly. No, mm-hmm. that's see, I thought about that, but because <laughs> he plays a liar. I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm there are people that know both languages that would call that. Well, nobody called out Ipe, and he was. He said he went. Man, I went. You know where I went to? I went to Harvard. No one called out his. I went to Harvard. I went to Harvard and Yale. Yep, and I have a, and, I have a master's from Princeton and, and MIT. Eastern Mennonite University, but I did not go to Stanford <laughs> or Florida. <laughs> or Florida, yeah. Okay, so what did we think about what he said? I mean, Kratz, nothing special here because this was the story that we were given after the original story that was given. He said he didn't know anything until basically everyone else found out about it, right? After that first game, everything starts to hit, which does line up with him being chummy with Ipe in game one, and then Ipe disappearing in game two, and Otani being a little more stoic when they had the ISO shots of him in that second Soul Series game. I, that was the part that was the part that to me was clarified because there's a lot going around. Oh, this doesn't look like a guy who stole money from you. And you figure the guy was doing a lot of shady things, clearly. I mean, now we're assuming he is guilty until proven innocent, Ipe. And if he was able to hide this until it was announced to the team to even Shohei, it show you know, imagine the week that Shohei's had since then. All the things he's like, well, what else did I miss out on? Like, I have all these, like, endorsement deals. Did they offer me more money? Is he pay taking some of my other money? Like, to me, that that was the most telling thing when he said he had no idea about it until there was the team meeting in Korea. Uh, I, I think you're wrong on one, one account of that, where he's not guilty until proven innocent. I mean, he admitted what he did. So, I mean, there's no, no – I mean, I mean when you pay. come – that, Ipe came out and said what he did, didn't he? He's like, yeah, I stole money. I mean, basically. No, he didn't say he stole money. Oh, he said he, well, whatever. He said he gambled and. And that he got money from Shohei. Otani to pay off the debt. Yeah, but Otani then he changed. goes, nah, you stole my money. Well, either one. I mean, listen, Ipe gambled. We know that. I mean, yeah. allegedly. Uh, but I mean, but then this is funny to me, what, you know, Craig Calcitero said. There's been so much going on with the Otani stuff that I think we really, really need to marvel at how <laughs> G-damn dumb. Andrew Freeman was for standing up in a team meeting and saying, quote, yeah, my dudes, those payments were to pay Mizuhara's gambling debts. See, that's where it gets fishy because you're like, wait. First of all, okay, I know that in, in Daniel Kim, we'll, shoot, we'll probably show his tweets here in a second, but yeah. he came out and said he'd open bank accounts and DMVs to get licenses. But like, okay, great. I mean, if I have to go get a bank account, you know, okay, cool. Like you're opening it for me, but you're not controlling it. So how in the world, this is what where it gets weird to me is $4.5 million when missing that we know about, right? Like that's a lot of damn money to have just go bye-bye. I, I'm sorry. Like, it's not like it's 10 bucks, like four point, and, and this was like, I guess over years of time. So, but, okay. So he took out two $500,000 loans this year or whatever you want to call it. Like that's a million dollars. It's gone from this year alone. Like, you don't think you would notice that? I would notice that. You, no. me, for sure. You, most likely. Him, how much oh, money notice. he makes. I know, but how about how about how much money he makes? Eno Cyrus posted something that that he read that said, you know, his, his mom was controlling his finances when he was in Japan. You you know this as a player, because I know this. But my mom would notice, and my mom was controlling it. She'd be like, 
Hey, you had fifty yeah, million. But maybe and, eBay was controlling <clears throat> some of this. It's cra- that's so crazy. That's crazy. Right then that's then that's listen. That's on Shohei for allowing somebody to do that, and anybody else that allows someone else to control their. It's like I remember a couple of baseball players got taken. I think Jake Peavy was one of them, right? Because they're financial guy. Well, like they're like, oh, I didn't look at it. I trusted him. Like, dude, I have a financial hmm. guy. I still look at my shit. I'm like, yep. I want to know. They can still do some shady stuff. They could, but at least I'm looking at it. I look at it, you know, once a week to be like, hey, what's going on here? Sure. I mean, that's just called being a mature adult. Do you know what AML is? Do you know what that stands for? Anti money laundering. When (laughs) millions of dollars are being exchanged in a wire, it sets off a red flag for basically any legit bank, and they'd be like, what's going on? If you send a 10000 it's $10,000, I thought. If you send it, if I send somebody more than $10,000, that's why, like, when you write a check, if you write, like, people will write 9999 because if you hit 10000 it flags the IRS and it flags the, the government to be like, why are you sending somebody over $10,000? So, I mean, $500,000, you think, would really raise a red flag. Well, it did. That's why this all came to light. It's all, this whole thing is just crazy. I'm, but, but okay, but, like, what's the, what's the result here? Like, because there is a crazy story to all of this. But on the baseball side of mm. things, he's not going to miss time. There'll be yeah. a distraction. Yeah. I don't think he's going to miss time. So you're saying, okay. Okay. No, but uh, again, I hope he doesn't because I hope he did nothing wrong. But let's – there's an also a legal precedent here. Like, you can't send money to a bookie. Like, that's against the law. Like, I don't care if he – you can't send money to I – can't, I can't go in my account and be like, man, I lost $500,000 to a bookie. I'm just going to wire him. That's that's against the law. Understood. But just looking at some past precedent in cases like this, they usually go after the bookie and not. The but Major League Baseball and the CBA, if you read all the details, it says if you send money to a bookie, you're available to be suspended. Yeah, and if you listen to either Dodgers territory or fair territory with Ken Milana, they explained how Jared Cosart was in a situation like yes. this, and they just gave him – a slap on the wrist and give us a few money, a few bucks as a fine, and you're good to go. You know, so I think it's fine. Okay. Well, I mean, listen. I hope he doesn't. But you see, I mean, I don't want to talk about. It, but you see, Pete Rose last night. That was kind of funny. I didn't. I saw. I, I was. Did you see what Pete Rose said? It was. I mean, listen. It was Pete Rose. It was kind of funny. What? Did I you mean, say? it was. Well, he. So he was, why, why am I not? Either? No, he he was sitting no. next to his buddy, and and he just goes, you know, if I had an interpreter. I'd still be involved in the game or something like that. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, it was, it was yeah, so, it's, it's just, tough. It, it's just one of those things that, you know, it was like the perfect timing, but it was so wrong, but it was, you know, listen, I mean, if you're Pete Rose at this point, what else can you do? You I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead, Kratz. No, I, the only thing I was going to say was when AJ was talking about checking his money, I know a legitimate all-star who, was single at the time and making he was making about 15 to 20 a year and he owned nothing he owned nothing and he was like yeah just i let my i let my brother take care of stuff and you know he takes care of it for me and that's about it i was like so you don't he didn't own his apartment that he lived in he didn't own the car that he got for free his brother took care of his money for him. He's like, I don't really need money. So whatever, I, you know, I trust him. And I was like, what? I was like, how? He's like, it's my brother. Why would he ever take me for anything? So do, plenty of dudes do it. Plenty of dudes do it. And yes, $4.5 million is a lot to miss. But if you're making fifteen dollars a year, I mean, Shoney maybe made $20 million a year off the field in endorsements. Four point five million. I'm sure he could he could miss over time without without seeing if he didn't if he didn't pay attention. Do you know how much money he's making endorsements this year? I mean, this year the numbers no. I saw were around thirty five million dollars. Still, I don't care how much money you're making. I know some guys that are bees, I, and they would miss four million dollars. They'd miss five hundred thousand dollars. Well, that's and you because should. they're good at counting money. That's yes. what, yeah. But I don't. But again, I don't Show care. Oh, hey, wax money. baseballs. And he throws them really hard. Yeah, I, I'm on. I'm on the side of many humans not knowing 
everything yep. about their finances, financial That's literacy in general in the country. Well, I mean, there was a whole 30 for 30, remember, on ESPN about all the basketball players that were a yep, lot of broke. basketball players that all went, Antoine Walker and all them did a whole thing about. Yeah. There was some, happens there all was the some time. fake news in that doc. There's story fake for news. another day. Yeah. Oh. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you at some point. I mean, Antoine Walker still looks like he's doing all right, but he says he lost every dollar. He, he did. He did. He lost a lot of money because he was then doing a speaking tour. He lost like nine figures. <laughs> so yeah, it can happen. Yeah. Wait, I have one more question because I think we're going to get to Ken soon too. Did he need to come out and speak? Yes. Or would a yes. press release no. have done the trick? Because there's some people that are like, why just read a press release when you can release the press release? No. Had to speak. For his teammates to not deal with it? His no. teammates not to deal with it and for people to see his face when he reads it yes. and actually see him do it. You why? Can't, because there's a difference between releasing a press release and actually speaking on something. People people can see your body language. People can. It can it's just it's just a better look if you speak on it yourself than releasing a press release. But there's no questions. And there's a deep drive to left. Oh wait, sorry. Um, <laughs> there's no questions though. He wasn't answering questions. So if you're just reading something, couldn't I just get the no, transcript? You got You got to stand up and, and read it. Okay. And listen, I thought I do. Do I think he should have taken some questions? Maybe. Maybe some. You know, like, uh, what was it? Some teams were like, uh, Pirates were like, hey, you got, we're going to pre-screen the questions so they knew it was coming. But <laughs> it's still more, still more important to, like, sit there and answer the questions and – or not answer the questions, but make this statement yourself and say, look into the camera and say, this is me, blah, blah, blah. And, all right, let's move on. But it's not going away. This ain't going away. <laughs> no, it's not. It is if not. you're a teammate, though, Kratz, and you hear him speak, does that resonate more that he goes you know, to the world and says his story? No, not as a teammate. I'm, I'm, I'm riding or dying with this guy no matter what. If he's my teammate, like that's this doesn't do anything for me. If I'm getting days of you know, questions and questioning about about this, then maybe. But I, I am spot on with AJ. If you go up front, at some point, your body language will show people remorse, arrogance, whatever it is. And I thought I thought it was really important. And questions, I don't know. I feel like there's so much legal stuff. If he'd gotten questions, he'd sit there and go, ah, you know what? I can't, I can't, oh, I, I can say this. I can't say that. Legally, I'm not allowed. So I think it would have just been hemming and hauling. But I, I definitely, I appreciated him stepping up and, and saying what he said. Yeah. And now you play ball. You get out of the way. His teammates will have his back. And now, now, unless something comes out more, like Kratz said, like, dude, you're, dude, you're my guy. Like I'm riding with you. You're in this locker room. You're in those buses. You're on those planes. You're on that field. You're in that box with me. I'm with you. Now, if something comes out where, God forbid something comes out where it's just a, something awful, then then guys will be like, we can't do this anymore, mm -hmm. right? Which is what we all, right, Kratz? I mean, I've been on, again, I've been on teams where guys have done stuff, and you're like, okay, we got you, buddy. We, we got you. Give them a hug, and like, we got your back. Let's go. We'll ride with you. Yep. And then we've been on teams where other stuff is coming out, and you're like, listen, bro, you're I can't help you on this. Like, uh, you're on your own now. Like, yep. like, it, like meaning more stuff, like, even if it's different stuff, like there, you know, but yeah, there's a line, right? Of course. If, if like I've been on out, teams where yeah. guys have done stuff and you're like, we got gotcha. you. And you've been on teams where guys have done <laughs> steroids and you're like, guess what? You're out, bro. Sorry. Yeah. You know, like, See ya. because that's just, but you know, listen, we all make mistakes and you move on. Yeah. And you got to focus on the season too. There's a lot riding on this LA season. So <laughs> let's bring in FT senior insider, Ken Rosenthal right now. Whew. There was already a massive spotlight on the Dodgers. And then, of course, this story drops. So, Ken, I know you did fair territory leading up to the press conference. What were your thoughts on how this all went down last night? Certainly, it was interesting to hear him be so upfront and take a head-on approach to what is going on. Now, there was never going to be a question and answer session, not when you've got a federal investigation going on, an MLB investigation going on. I thought initially when I heard he was going to talk, we were going to get very little. 
and we got a lot more than that. We basically got his explanation. Now, we did not get every answer, and there are still a lot of questions that I and a lot of other people would like to see answered, namely, how did Ipe have access to these bank accounts? How was he making these payments without Shohei knowing about them? These are all reasonable questions that in due time, I am hoping that we get answers to. But I heard what you guys were saying, and I generally agree. For what that was, that was about as good as it could have been. Now, is it the truth? It's hard to know with 100% certainty that it's the truth or 75% of the truth or 50% of the truth. But the one thing I said on my show yesterday and the one thing that makes some sense to me is that if you're going after someone and you're accusing them of massive theft, if your lawyers are going to the authorities with that, you're leaving yourself open too. And if a person generally who has done bad things is not going to take that approach. So because he has been so aggressive in pointing out, in his view, what Ipe has done, it would seem to me that that would lean in his favor. That reinforces what he is saying. You can make the case he still could be lying and this all could be a bunch of nothing, but I don't know. It's, it's hard to know exactly, but certainly the story that they're presenting is plausible. And that is all we have to go on right now. I would imagine in time through the federal investigation in particular, more will be known about just how this worked and how it went down, how Ipe was sending that money to the bookie without Shohei's knowledge, if that is indeed what was happening. But right now, that is the lingering thing for me, just how this all could take place, how millions of dollars could transfer without Shohei Otani's knowledge. Ken, uh, I hear you need a translator for Fox, so give me access to your bank accounts with all the money you make, and I will be happy to do it for you. <laughs> well, I will say this, that people in powerful positions with a lot of money, they do dole out responsibilities to others. We've seen this in entertainment where entertainers get scammed. We've seen it with athletes where athletes get violated or they have their trust violated by people that are close to them. That is not out of the realm. The amount of money here and the way this went down and just all of the things that supposedly happened. Again, I, I just would like to hear more. Okay, Ken. How, I mean, that wasn't my question, but of course you had an answer. So uh, what... <laughs> how long do we think this will go on? Like, how long could this drag on? And do you think at some point it could become a distraction for not only Otani, but his teammates and the Dodgers organization? I don't know, AJ, how long this investigation will take. And if you ask the federal government, the investigators, if we had them on the air right now, which we wouldn't because they're federal investigators, but if you ask them, they probably would say, we don't know. We have to just do our process and go through what we go through. Could it become a distraction? I would say it would become a distraction only if more comes out. As the season begins, as we get rolling here and we're in the same place, I can't imagine it being too much of a distraction. But there are going to be things that are leveled on social media that are going to come up. They've already been things on social media we've seen accusing him of this and that and the other thing. And that's the world we live in today. If any of those gather steam, if there's any validity to any of them, then maybe it becomes a distraction. But I would expect that the noise will diminish as these investigations continue, as long as nothing else comes out. Distractions to other players. Is there any inclination or like where investigators have to like interview the other players, like interview Mookie Betts in his time, interview Mike Trout with his time with Ipe, interview, like, are there, do the investigators have to interview current players who are active because the season's starting and any kind of extra interview is a distraction? You're asking me how a federal investigation works, Eric, and <laughs> I can't say I know the answer to that. Is it possible that those people the Angels in particular would be interviewed, yeah. I guess. But if I'm Mike Trout and a federal investigator wants to talk to me for two hours about it Bay on even a game day, it's only so much of a distraction. I, I can't see that being an issue if it comes up at all. Yeah. Uh, Ken, let's go to the youngsters that are making ball clubs. Well, one that does and one that doesn't. But let's start with the positives. 
You wrote about Wyatt Langford. Can you give us more context on what you're learning about him and how special the defending champs could be with a potential rookie of the year coming through? It's amazing. They actually have two potential rookies of the year because Evan Carter is still a rookie. Remember, he just came up last September. Of course, he played in the playoffs, but he technically is still a rookie. But Wyatt Langford, number four pick in last year's draft out of the University of Florida, hit at Florida like crazy, hit in the minors like crazy, hit in the spring like crazy. And he not only has all of that, because numbers are numbers, and listen, we all know at the highest level, all players get exposed. But he has a demeanor about him, a way about him, as does Carter for that matter, that is professional, it's mature, and has really impressed the Rangers all spring, and even going back to the taxi squad last postseason. So here's a kid who is going to be in their opening day lineup, the defending World Series champions opening day lineup. He, I expect, will be somewhere in the middle of the order, three through six in that range, and they have that kind of faith in him. Chris Young, their general manager, has said, people ask me, do we think about sending him down? He didn't give us an opportunity to think about sending him down. So that's how much of an impression he has made on them. And he really seems to be, from an offensive standpoint, an extremely special talent. Defensively, not as strong. He's going to DH quite a bit, I would expect. In the outfield, he's just okay, it seems. But it's going to be exciting to watch him play because the thing that he has at the plate is this calm, see the field kind of thing. And he, his pitch recognition from what Tim Hires, the hitting coach, says is off the charts. Tim Hires had Mookie Betts in Boston. Mookie Betts is his all-time guy in pitch recognition. And he said that Langford is basically close to that class. So we'll see how it all plays out, but I do not expect this kid to fail. He might struggle early on. He might have to get sent to the minors like Mike Trout did after a month. But it seems to me that the Rangers got a good one here. Is there a chance that they could steal Rookie of the Year votes? You see it happen with MVP from each other. And as a, you know, somebody who's voting for that, is that something that goes into your thought like, ah, you know what? I can't, I can't figure out, you know, if, if Langford was as good as he should have been or Carter was there because of that. Do you see that as a possibility for people who are trying to pick who the rookie of the year is going to be? I don't see it as a problem, Eric, because if you're voting, right, you're not going to penalize one because of the other. I believe the rookie of the year, you vote for three. So there are three places on the ballot. And if Carter and Langford are one, two, or Langford and Carter are one, two, you'll place them accordingly. I guess there are voters, and I don't want to speak for all voters, and I can't account for the voting patterns of all of our members, but I guess there are some who might say, I'm only voting for one Ranger, but that's kind of dumb, and <laughs> I just don't see that happening. The writers would never do anything dumb, right, Ken? Well, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, the Langford story is, is amazing to me because he was a, basically a non-important player in University of Florida his freshman year. I think he got two about two. He was the bullpen catcher. He stuck it out, didn't transfer, went in the weight room, got his body in shape, became an outfielder, obviously hit a sophomore year, and then his junior year he went off, became the number four overall pick. But you mentioned Carter and Langford. You also talked about another guy that was supposed to be in the rookie of the year voting in Jackson Holiday, and he's going to Norfolk in AAA. So how does this affect the Orioles? And I, I, I'm sorry, I, I will admit this. I did not hear what you said about it, so I want to hear – why in the heck didn't this guy make the team? Because you said the Rangers never were given an opportunity to send Langford down. Well, Jackson Holiday raked in spring training too and seemed like it would be a great fit. So why did they make that decision? AJ, you make a great point there. And I will go back to something you guys experienced as players, if not yourselves, certainly seeing it with teammates. Teams generally make the decisions that provide the least amount of resistance. Now you can say, well, whoa. Jackson Holiday sending him down is a good amount of resistance. Why would you even do that? He hit 300 in the spring at a 900 OPS. But there are other considerations in play. And don't take this as me justifying this move. I'm just going to try to explain what their thinking might have been. They've got two infielders, Mateo and Urias, who are out of options. And they don't want to risk sending one of them to the minors and losing them when they represent valuable depth. 
Jackson Holiday is 20 years old. He's played only a little bit above double A. I believe it's 14 games at triple A, something along those lines. He is someone who they feel needs to improve perhaps against the advanced left-handed pitching he'll see as a left-handed hitter. He is someone learning a new position. He's 20 years old. All of these reasons are legitimate reasons. The problem is that the general manager, Mike Elias, said as far back as December, hey, this guy's got a really good shot. Well, if he's got a really good shot and he does nothing wrong, then what is the issue? And I think the issue is some of these roster considerations. They don't want to bring Holiday up and not play him. It seems like it's all of that. But at the same time, I know what Scott said and has been very critical. I know some friends of mine in Baltimore, actually one in the media, who is disgusted with this decision. He's absolutely upset with it. And I get that too, because if the goal is to put your best team on the field, put your best team on the field. Let's go. And I know service time has been raised as a possibility. And Jackson Holiday is represented by Scott Boris. You can get an extra year if you keep him in the minor leagues, an extra year of control for a certain amount of time. But under the current CBA, the new one, if you finish 1-2 in Rookie of the Year, it doesn't matter when you come up, you get a full year of service. This happened with Tanner Bybee last year of the Guardians. He came up, I believe, in May. I'm not exactly sure. Don't hold me to that. He did not open the season, put it that way. And yet he finished second in the Rookie of the Year and got a full year of service. So... The idea of playing service time games at this point is pretty obsolete. It just seems that all of these other considerations were in play. I'm not sure I agree with this decision, but I do understand where they were coming from. Do you think that the new rules that they did put in place suffice any service manipulation? Because I went on a radio station in Baltimore this morning, defending the same thing I said on foul territory yesterday, and Scott and I had an argument about it, that I think the rules are fair. And, and service time manipulation, I get it. You get an extra year out of them, possibly, if he's not one or two. But the best team on the field is not the best 26 to start the season. It's the best team on the field for 48 to 55 guys for the entire season. So do you feel like the changes that they made in the CBA are valuable or are working correctly in a situation like this? Because he's not Chris Bryant or Wyatt Langford coming out of a college. They've helped. And the rules are never going to be perfect. When you have pay dictated by service, you're always going to have the possibility of manipulation. No matter what rules you put in, no matter what system you put in, there's always going to be that specter hanging over it. But I do believe because of the example I just cited and also the other idea when you start the season with a rookie on the opening day roster and he wins rookie of the year, you get the extra draft pick. This happened with the Orioles last year and Gunnar Henderson. So they've proven that they will do this. They just for the reasons that I stated and maybe some others, I don't know, did not want to do that with Jackson Holiday. And the other thing I'll say here, and again, I'm hesitant because I know it's going to come off sounding like an apologist for the Orioles, but in this particular case, it's the opening day roster. I get it. He's going to be with the team for most of the season. And we make too much of the opening day roster and who's on it because the rosters, as we know, change so dramatically over the course of the season. You could argue fairly that this does not send the right message that this kid earned it and man, play your best players. Just don't worry about anything else. Play your best players. But there are always these other considerations, who you might lose, all those kinds of things. And we'll see how it plays out. I would say this, that Elias, because of the way they handled Gunnar Henderson last year, because of their success with developing Adley Rushman, he deserves the benefit of the doubt here, even if we disagree with his decision. They've done a pretty darn good job of developing talent. And they also sent back to the minor leagues some other really good players, Mayo and Kierstad. Now, none as Jackson Holiday, but these guys could end up being stars in the major leagues. But the Orioles roster is so crowded right now that it just makes it difficult. Hey, I've got one more on the Orioles on a different note, because we're going to talk about this story right after we let you go here. 
Do you think that the new ownership group will try and make some type of splash when they come in? It sounds like they are going to get the approval tomorrow, the day before opening day. So I'm wondering if an extension gets worked on for one of the young stars like Rutschman or Gunnar Henderson. Jordan Montgomery is still out there. We've seen ownership groups do this. I know it's weird timing, but you could throw some money out there and show the city that you're going to be different. What do you say? It's a good question, Scott. Now, they have 40% of the team coming in. They had the right to purchase the rest, this new group, upon the death of Peter Angelos, which of course occurred last weekend. I don't know and I would not expect that that transaction has taken place yet. So the question I would have is, if you've got 40% now, do you have the authority and the power to go ahead and sign Jordan Montgomery? Let's put that one out there. That's the obvious one right now. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know their inclination. I don't know what Mike Elias would say, but it wouldn't cost them a draft pick. He did not receive a qualifying offer because he was traded in the middle of a season. And that would be step one. That would be the first thing you could do to really shore up your team. But I just don't know where they stand as far as how much control they're going to have right away and how that plays out in the future. Okay, fair. I know some Baltimore fans are like, here we go. Things are about to change. Open well, up things the are about to change. No, there's no question yeah. about that. Things are going to change, and it would seem for the better. But mm-hmm. will they change immediately? That's what you're asking, and I don't know the answer to that. Yes, fair. Well, Ken, thank you very much. Appreciate the time. We'll catch you later this oh, week. Hold on, Ken. What? What? Dude, you, you don't pay attention. Yo, I'm doing 90 things. Dude, we'll Just pay attention. Punch yeah. me. Next time I will punch you. Um, Ken, I know you spent a lot of time in Baltimore. We're talking about Baltimore. I'm assuming you saw what happened in Baltimore last night. Um, I know you probably went over that bridge a few times. So I just wanted to say, I know we didn't hit on it yet, but like praying for the people and all that happened that last night and the people that are still missing and all that. I know you're a Baltimore guy. So while you're on, I figured you might have a thought or two about that. AJ, I was absolutely shocked when I saw that this morning. And that bridge is a staple in Baltimore, like any bridge in any city. And to have something like that happen is just heartbreaking. And let's just hope they find enough people and people are okay. But that was just a shocking, shocking thing. And I'm sure the whole city is just waking up this morning or experiencing their day and kind of numb because it was awful. And I don't know that there's much more I can add than that. It was just an unbelievable thing to see. Yeah, Ken, thank you. Yeah, thinking about everyone um, in Baltimore that, that's affected by the terrible tragedy that's going on out there right now. Ken, we will grab you later this week, all right? Thanks, guys. Thank you. And, of course, fair territory is not just once, but twice every single week. So. Ken's latest came on Monday talking about the union tumultuous situation that has been going down there, the Mets and J.D. Martinez, um, and many other topics. Obviously, grilling Ken, if you have questions for Ken, he throws that out there. And you can ask questions to Ken and Alana every Thursday at 12.30 Eastern time leading up to foul territory. So you'll have 12.30 fair tee into 1 o'clock foul territory on opening day of the season. All right, now let's go over that Orioles ownership situation a little bit more. Show me the money. (laughs) Show me the money! Show me the money! (laughs) We prepared another... Was there anybody (laughs) even watching this that was even saw Jerry Maguire when it was made? Yes, I would say the majority of the chat. If you haven't, you should. where that comes from. Yeah, even if you're a kid, that movie still plays. Right? Yeah, it was a good movie. It was a really good movie. It's from Jerry Maguire, kids. Yeah, there's plenty of people in the chat that aren't. The chat's not just full of 20-year-olds. You know that, right? Uh, I'm aware. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, that, that, <laughs> that, that movie's from, old, though. That movie's like 30 years old, isn't it? Is it from, what, mid-90s? It's got to be. Put a guess. Put a guess, and I'll look it up. It's got to be late, like 97, 98, I think. Yeah, I was going to say 96. 96. Jerry Maguire. Good job. Anyway, we was have a lot 96? of new little. Yeah, it was ninety six. Let's Nailed go, it. Eric. One nothing. Good job. All right, so I'll give you a number: a hundred. A hundred percent of owners are going to vote for 
the new group to take over because every vote publicly is 100% when the owners <laughs> get together. Okay, a little, a little secret. That's how it works. Even if there's dissension, by the time we get to the public vote, it's 100. So he needs 75% to be approved. David Rubenstein will take over the Baltimore Orioles on Wednesday. Okay, it's a prediction I feel pretty good about. It's my yeah, I first lock. I think he's year. already got it. Yeah, he's already. Wait, got oh it. my gosh, do we have to start doing? Lo- we gotta start doing locks again. No yeah. Way. Oh my gosh, my heart. Thursday. My heart. My heart. I don't know if my heart can take it. <laughs> Thursday, you're gonna get that. That Gosh. 958 texts from AJ being like, damn it, I got to stay up and make sure I hit my game up. <laughs> Taking an early game. Take, what, early who plays games. at 1 o'clock? Oh, one, 1 o'clock. Right? Who plays at 1 o'clock? That's the game one, I'm one taking. Game. You can't take a 1 o'clock damn it. game. All right. You got to take something later. There's a bunch of boards, I think. <laughs> anyway, uh, David Runstein's going to take over. As far as I know, they are not going to have, you know, the – whatever the number is, 80, 90% of the team right up, right off the jump, that has to deal with like taxes and, and Peter Angelos passing away. Um, but they will have enough of a stake of the team to be the controller of the team, which means that they make the decisions. So if that's the case, they could offer extensions to young players. They could look for a Jordan Montgomery. Just throwing that out there. You, you want to make a splash when you come in as a new owner because it is about your reputation and marketing that things are going to be different. That is the best way to do it. If you like that picture, it will be money well spent. I guarantee it. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it should happen. Uh, why, why don't people like that idea? Because it's not like you're just... He didn't just receive a check and like, oh, here we go. We're just going to go for it. You have to like, you got to have a plan. You got to have a plan of what you're going to do with the team, not just, eh, I have millions of dollars. Here's 150 to a pitcher. Like, you might you might make a splash with fans, and I think ownership is about the relationship with fans in your city. But what kind of splash and and, and like – precedent are you setting with the people who run your organization are they looking to fire everybody in the front office are they looking to fire their gm no like they're buying a team for what it is and what it's been built and so they have to have the discussions hey you know what should we go after montgomery hey mr rubenstein i know that you just bought the team do you want us to go after jordan montgomery we don't really like him, but if that's what you want, or we really like Jordan Montgomery, can we have $150 million? Like, maybe too soon? I don't know. I think it would be awesome. I think it'd be great, but I'm, I'm, I wasn't listening because I was joining. You did join the club. I was joining the club, and there's a Kratz emoji, and there's a Rosenthal emoji, but there's no Scott emoji. It's all coming. And there's no, I don't know. Here's, here's emoji. Here's Scott's emoji. Oh, I can drop that one in the chat. That's it. Just one bicep from Scotty or maybe like a lower ab or something. That would be Scott's emoji. And it's a cartoon one because it's, it's fake news. It's fake. (laughs) Um, <laughs> and I was just told we can only have five. What are the five? I want to know what the five are now. All right, we're we're going to go over it later on in the show because we have our next guest ready to join yeah. us right now on FT Live. He is a member of the Chicago White Sox starting rotation coming off a dazzling spring. Let's bring in Mike Soroka. Mike, great to have you on. How was spring training with the new ball club? Spring training was great. Thanks for having me on, guys. It was, uh, yeah, different. It was my first spring with a new club and um you know i know these two guys have have been with quite a few so they got to experience that quite a few times but uh yeah it was a little different Uh, a lot of new names a lot of new faces um you know it was it was a great experience and you know getting to talk to chris getz and uh pedro grafal and everything that they wanted for the club this year i think it's going to be a good fit michael you're i'm i'm assuming you're in chicago you're moving into your new place what's what's the weather like it's actually pretty good here right now I'll take it. If it's uh, 55 and not too wet, um, I will absolutely take that for the uh, first couple of weeks of the year here. Okay, well, you're from Can- He's from Canada, dude. <laughs> so I was figuring he wanted it to snow and like 
you know, sleet. So while he's out there pitching, so he's used to his homeland weather. Stop. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't. It wouldn't be too bad for me because I know it's harder hitting in the cold. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd I'd take that. I wouldn't be too mad. He's from Florida. Don't 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 take his naivety. Like you didn't grow up in the Yukon Territory. Like everybody thinks like Canada is just the coldest place on earth. You're from Florida. Like it's a little rainy. The issue is you're gonna have that same weather all the way till the end of May in Chicago. Yeah, maybe it's uh, it's looking okay right now. So, um, like I said, I've I've been we were we opened the season here in nineteen, and it was right before I got called up, and I remember watching it snow. Uh, snow and wind, and it was like 32, uh, and it, yeah, not good. I, I, I don't need that. And he's from Calgary. So I've been to Calgary. Three. I've been to the Stampede before, yes. eh? There you go. Yeah, don't Beautiful. you know? He knows, about, he knows about Medicine Hat, right? You know about Medicine Hat, where I made my rookie debut? Of course, of course, Med Hat. And, uh, you know, we actually got a, a Med Hat resident uh in uh, he's the head trainer for the angels uh mike frosted he's uh he's from calgary but lives in medicine hat too so uh, that was my trainer kind of, that was my go. trainer frosty frosty was frosty's a guy and then you have voon chung from vancouver so you you canadians are, are repping I, I came up with the blue jays so i know all that all that lingo don't you know hey michael i want to i want to ask you about this spring training and just kind of feeling normal. Obviously, you know, your story is well documented about fighting through some injuries to get back to this point. So last year, at one point, you make your return. It had been, I think, 34 months since you were pitching in the bigs. And so you kind of get through that. You're, you're back and you're pitching. Now I'm sure you're focusing on, okay, now let me, let me take that next step and get back to, to the pitcher that I was. One story that I read was Alex Anthopoulos showing you a case like Jake Berger, who actually was on the White Sox last year. Can you elaborate on how that went and if that was helpful for you? Yeah, it was huge. Um, you know, I think initially when you do it the first time, uh, you, you t talk around the league a little bit and there's a bunch of guys that have kind of had Achilles problems before. And, um, you know, when it happens the second time, it was, you know, kind of, it was devastating. I didn't know whether that was kind of going to be it for me. Um, I didn't know that Jake had done it twice until Alex had actually called me that day and said, look, there's a kid on the White Sox. He's done it, done it twice and he's, he's running, he's moving pretty well. And, um, you know, I believe you can do this too. And they stuck with me through that and I'm, I'm very thankful. So, um, you know, Dr. Uh, Anderson up in Green Bay, uh, had me work with his staff, his, his, uh, AT and PTs up there. And, uh, we got to work and again, very very thankful to have those connections because uh, I wouldn't have made it through without them. Michael, what, what, what's it like? We talk to guys all the time about Tommy John and how they have to go. They're kind of lonely, but I mean, you went through it twice, right? So what's it like? Are you lonely? Are you, were you in Atlanta? Were you in the clubhouse? Because I remember when I was with the Braves at one point, they were like, if you're hurt, you got to go to Orlando where the time was where our spring training site was. And Freddie Freeman's like, I ain't going to Orlando. And they're like, oh, okay. Well, everyone else except Freddie Freeman has to go to Orlando. So <laughs> what, what was it like? Were you in Atlanta? Were you in Northport where their spring training was? And were there days where you're like, man, I don't know. I can make it through this again. Yeah, so I, I, I guess I have Freddie to thank for that because most of our long-term rehabs actually stayed in Atlanta um, if, if that's what we chose. So uh, I stayed there. I got to stay in my house for, for a little while and um, at least kind of have a consistent routine there and not be uh, totally alone down in Northport. Um, you know, it, it was it was really difficult for about six, six-ish months. You know, it's just things move very slowly in an Achilles rehab as it is, um, let alone, you know, doing it twice. It kind of doubles the length, um, you know, and then it, it just kind of became literally taking one step forward every single day. Um, you know, you hit some pretty good plateaus with, any rehab, but with that one, it felt like I wasn't getting better from month, you know, four through seven through eight, nine, ten, um, and then it wasn't honestly till about eighteen months where, you know, I felt like okay, you know, we're we're making it through this, and it's going to keep getting better. And uh, now I'm at the point where I guess we're about two two plus years out, and um, I feel like uh, the athlete that I once was. So 
uh, everything's kind of coming back and I can kind of focus on just going out and playing and competing and doing what I know how to do. Okay, let me clarify. I know you didn't have Tommy John. Scott's over here trying to explain to me. I know you had Achilles, so I just want to make sure that, I didn't know that Scott understands English. Okay, I'm, I'm, we're Achilles speaking Canadian English. Today. Scott doesn't get it. Okay, <laughs> so sorry, Michael. But <laughs> what? <laughs> sorry, he's an idiot. Excuse he's him. My case, yeah. Excuse him. I just got my own emoji or whatever you call it, so I'm I'm proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, but then, okay, so you come back from the two Achilles, right? And then you, you, you come back to the big leagues, and then you go back to AAA. Explain that, because you weren't really effective pitcher before both of these things happened. So how do you grind through going back to AAA? And they're like, well, we don't know if you're going to do this again. Um, yeah, I mean, there was uh, obviously some stuff that, uh, you know, I had to work through at the beginning of last year, uh, just getting back out there and, and playing. Um, was kind of, you know, different. I think there was still a lot of stuff at the back, back of my mind that was, you know, injury related. And, uh, there was some doubt there. And then you kind of get to the point where you realize you just, you know, have to make the decision to be confident and get rid of that doubt. And that doubt doesn't matter. And, um, you're going to do what you can after, you know, whatever happens in competition, whether you win or lose, you're going to move forward the next day, no matter what. And, um, you know, I went back down and there was definitely some things I, I was starting to figure out. Uh, I think I, I really was coming along. Um, you know, I think um, I went back down again in August even. And when I felt like, you know, I was ready to, to be back in the big leagues full time. And um, I thought I, I thought I proved that. So um, thankfully, the White Sox saw that and said that, uh, you know, they're, they're giving me a rotation spot this year to work with. And I wanted to make sure I went out in camp and, and also earned that. I felt like I did. So, um, you know, again, it's it's just kind of about taking steps forward and put that doubt behind me and, and understanding that that uh, doesn't have too much to do with exactly where I want to be. And uh, if anything, it's it's allowed me to learn a bunch of stuff that uh, is going to allow me to hopefully be there for a long time. Now, you went from a team that is going to be a perennial World Series contender to – AJ's favorite team in the world. And he's still trying to choose to figure out if he still wants to be a White Sox fan or not. What are the differences that you see in these organizations, good or bad? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, obviously this is the first year uh, of, of complete control under Chris Gaps. Um, So that's, it's a little bit different than it used to be is what I've heard. Um, you know, I think over there, it was just a matter, it was, it's very hands-off, uh, and you get the ability to do that with uh, a lineup like that and, and people, um, you know, expect, you know, to contend for a World Series every year. And I think that's that's something that we've made a point of is saying that, look, you know, it didn't, it didn't exactly happen overnight over there either. Um, you know, 2018, I got called up and uh, nobody had picked us to be anywhere near uh, winning the pennant that year, and uh, they did that, and again in 19, and um, kind of moved forward. And then, I mean, it was just kind of that general belief that we knew we were better than what people were telling us, and uh, I don't think that's too uh, dissimilar from where we are right now uh, with the White Sox. I think that there's a lot of guys on this roster that have had some down years recently that uh, are looking to put together career seasons, and show that they still belong in this game at the highest level. And uh, I think that makes for a really gritty ball club, if, if you know what I mean. It's uh, kind of how it, uh, it's shaping up, and I'm excited to see the guys go out there and let it eat. Hey, Mike, can we get an updated scouting report on what you're bringing to the table? Because obviously, you know, when you first burst into the league, you were a sinker baller, tons of ground balls, um, less than a strikeout per inning. I'm looking at spring training action, there's a lot more swing and miss. So we have a different Mike Soroka these days in a league that I guess is looking more and more for pitchers like that because of the shift restrictions as well. Um, yeah. So, I mean, obviously spring training is a small dose um, and things change a little bit when you got to go out there and, and you're throwing six, seven innings at a time, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I think the last, year and a half, really, last two years, I've understood that I needed to make some changes mechanically. Um, my delivery has changed a little bit, and, um, you know, that's all been by design. Um, I went and saw Bob Kais with uh, 3D Biokinetics in Utah, 
which is kind of a lesser known outfit. He doesn't really market too much, but uh, it's kind of one of the gold standard for uh, data and development. And uh, one person that has, you know, a database of 30 plus years to draw from and, um, you know, kind of showed me exactly what I needed to do to just stay out there and, and usually performance would follow. So uh, immediately that kind of resulted in, in having to figure a couple things out again. Um, my delivery as it was allowed me to throw a sinker, but not too much else. And that was kind of the thing is it was kind of pushing me to the side of my side of my breaking ball. Um, Changeup was really sporadic um, and four seam capabilities were pretty minimal. So um, once we kind of got things in order, I found out that, you know, I, I can still throw a sinker. It looks a little bit different, um, but, you know, learning and, and that's one thing Ethan Katz over here and, and Brian Bannister have been great at is showing me, you know, where that plays best now. Uh, you know, I used to be able to basically just throw it right down the middle and let it let it sink straight down, uh, as opposed to now it's it's a little more lateral. So uh, kind of opens up that front hipper to lefties, um, and then it's going to be a matter of actually combining the four and the two and, and kind of playing off them. So um, you know, I think that's one of the most underrated things in baseball is having two different fastballs that, that profile completely differently. Um, you know, and I think you look at some of the best that, that do it very well. It makes for a really difficult day. Um, you know, and I'd, I'd like to be that guy. So I'm um, looking to keep that, keep that moving forward. And um, whether the strikeouts stay or not, I guess we'll see, but uh, looking out there to go just throw a lot of innings and, and give a team a chance to win. First, I want to have a comment, then a question. The comment is the two fastballs. I love to hear that from you. From a young, you're still a young pitcher. Don't let anybody, the fact you've been in the game for almost six years now is crazy to me, and you're still only 26. But two fastballs, because you see so much on the internet, all this like, oh, this guy throws this, throw this pitch all the time. You're talking about pitching, and I love that. But you also glazed over something. You said, get into the sixth or seventh inning. Do you have an innings limit that the White Sox have put out there? Or do you have a innings goal that you want to get out there? Because you went 21 years old, you went 174 innings. Nowadays, you go 174 innings, guys are like, is there something wrong with him? Why is he out there so long? Like, and that should be the that should be the base of a guy who's, you know, sixth in the Cy Young. Yeah, I agree. I think um you know, throwing innings is always going to be important as a starter. Um, you know, what it can do for your bullpen to, to kind of alleviate arms throughout the course of the season. Um, you know, hearing from guys in the bullpen that, that tell you they love it when you pitch because they only have to cover maybe two or three innings. Um, that's a good feeling. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's interesting um, where inning totals have gone in the past. But, you know, I threw 120 last year with, kind of a slow played April. Um, and, you know, I feel like that set me up really well to just go out there and let it eat this year. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to hopefully beating that total in, in 2019, I guess it was. Um, you know, I missed two or three starts at the beginning of the season that year in, in AAA as well. So, um, I think uh, that's very attainable again, and I'm looking to, to at least shoot for that 180. We, we talked about this, Michael, a little bit that, you know, you went from the Braves who are contending for a World Series to the White Sox who probably, let's be honest, aren't going to contend for a World Series. And this comes from a guy that has lived and died with the White Sox for a long time now. Is there, there's a little bit of relief, at least for you, and I'm not saying this for the organization, but like you get to go to a place now and you can just pitch, right? You get to go out and you know if you're healthy, you pitch every fifth day. They're not going to be saying, oh no, we're in a pennant race, you know, and you're, and everyone has ups and downs. So there has to be a little bit of relief as a player, especially coming back from what you came back from and saying, man, I just get to pitch every fifth day and I can find myself and then build from there and help this team become a winner like you did in Atlanta. Um, yeah, a little bit. I think, you know, still what I've found to bring out the best in myself and, you know, most people is having that competition uh, to go out there and know that you got to earn that spot. Um, you know, that's how it's been in Atlanta for a long time. And I know Max Freed has spoken to that as well. And, um, you know, it was, if you're not the best arm 
in that spot at the time, um, they're going to find somebody who is. So, um, again, I, I think that creates a little bit of resilience. And um, I think that that mindset is still somewhat important to have to know that tomorrow is not guaranteed type of thing. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a balance there. And um, I, I feel as though having the freedom to understand that they're confident in the abilities that I have and that, you know, they want to see me out there for 30 plus starts this year. I think that's, that's the comfort that I take in it. Um, but that I'm going to go out there and, and earn that next start every time out. So, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's been a bit of both, but ultimately I think that there's some things that I managed to learn last year and push through, um, just because, you know, tomorrow wasn't guaranteed up there. So, um, you know, that's, that's always what's brought out the best in me and, I'm always looking forward to uh, to competing and, and learning and just getting better. Well, I'm not. Listen, I, I want to clarify. I'm not saying like you're you know you're not trying to win. You're not competitive. So I don't want people to think that. I know you're competitive and I know you want to do well. But I I was more just saying like you know being hurt, coming back, and now you're a free agent at the end of the year. Like this is your year. You can go out and give them 32 starts, maybe throw 190, 180, 190 innings. And then you can say, hey, maybe the White Sox will bring me back. I can help them climb. So I wasn't I, – I wanted to make understand that I, I'm not knocking you or your competitiveness at oh, all. Oh, for sure. Because, yeah, okay. All right. As long as you understand that, I don't care what Scott says. I don't care what anyone else says. But as long as you understand that, <laughs> know that I am rooting for you and I obviously want the White Sox to do well. For sure. No, thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it, I, I didn't think you were uh, going there. I was just kind of mentioning that – you know, there is that kind of edge in, in having a team that um, does want to win that I think we do. Uh, I think Pedro's kind of echoed that as well as, you know, we're playing uh, we're playing hard, gritty baseball. And, um, you know, we're looking to give you and the other the other White Sox fans something uh, uh, that's enjoyable to watch. And, um, you know, I've always said it with the way my hockey team is, the, the Calgary Flames, um, I've always would have rather they put a bunch of guys out there that are fighting for their career. Um, even if they're not necessarily coming away with results uh, at the top of the league, it's it's always more fun to go out there and watch a team that's given everything they got. And I think that's the minimum we can do, and we're going to do that. So basically, you should be a Flyers fan then, because we don't have a great we don't have a great team right now. But somehow we're going to find our way into the playoffs. But that's that's a hockey discussion. We're not supposed to talk about other sports here. In your <laughs> in your in your two years plus of rehabbing did you come up with any did you find any like cool hobbies like did you learn to juggle or did you do anything like that you're like man i completely wasted all my time on this um i uh, i've always actually played the guitar i've played the guitar for a long time and uh it wasn't till the quarantine for covid um and then obviously my injuries uh that i really kind of spent a ton of time on and uh, it's actually something that I, I have to make sure I keep in check and I, I dial it back on because I don't need uh, I don't need the shoulder tying up or to get carpal tunnel in my wrist. Um, we don't we do that so um, priority number one is still baseball, but uh, I have fallen in love with uh, music and and the guitar. Do you play for the team? Do you, do you ever do you ever get on the you ever get on the strings and and strum for the boys? And you're not gonna hurt you're not gonna hurt your wrist. That was. That was Joel Zumaya on Guitar Hero. That wasn't a real guitar. <laughs> so you'll be you'll be fine. But do you ever play for the team? And what's your go-to song? Uh, yeah, I mean, I got a I got a bond say. I'll probably be playing for them a little more this year because uh, we got a couple guys trying to learn. I think John John Brebbia just started. Uh, Kevin Pilar takes lessons with his daughter. He told me so. Um, you know, I'll be bringing it in a little bit. I, I got them here in Chicago. Um, yeah, I got, I got a ton. I, I don't really have a go-to. I kind of have a set list I'll run through. Um, like I said, kind of went, uh, I went all in. So uh, a lot of Metallica, a lot of, uh, a lot of harder rock, a lot of Alter Bridge. Um, that's kind of, uh, um, Alter Bridge. Yeah. 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 Wow. You're an Alter Bridge guy. Yeah. Miles and Huge Trevani and guy. Flip. Yeah, Tremani, Tremani's uh, my favorite. Uh, he's kind of my idol in the guitar industry. So uh, anything that he has, um, that's uh, I'm all over that. Okay, sorry, Scott. Why, why Alter Bridge over Creed? <laughs> uh, 
Oh, I mean, they kind of just Mark Tremonti, the guitarist, they, they let him explore a little more. Um, you know, they let him kind of go for it with Alter Bridge and, and kind of, uh, I believe, him and Miles, uh, the way that they wrote together, that they they kind of pushed his guitar to the front side of it. And then uh, in his solo, um, his band, Tremonti, um, you know, Friedman kind of joins him and, and it's it's much more guitar focused. That's kind of how I would how I would put it. Um, you know, and and I love Scott Sapp's voice, but Miles Kennedy's got a pretty good one too. So uh, I found them in in low A actually, almost, yeah, eight, nine, ten years ago, and uh, long bus trips blew through all those, and it's kind of where I fell in love with uh, playing like Mark. So um, I can't quite. Have you met? Come have you close met them before? To, I have not. No, I, I've never actually got to see them live either. I, I always miss them, and uh, I was hoping sometime in Orlando to do that because I know yeah. that they're uh, they're based there. I know I know a guy named I know a guy named uh, Mark Tremonti pretty well, and uh, I think we could maybe oh, really? somehow <laughs> somehow arrange yeah just a little bit. I know Flip, their drummer. Yeah, I know Miles. Uh, I know all those guys. Stapp. So yeah, uh, I've known them for a long. They're obviously, I live in oh, Orlando, really? so they've been around. Have you? I have to ask you this since you're such a Tremonti fan. Have you heard Tremonti sing Sinatra? Yep. Yeah, I actually showed that it's to, incredible. Uh, to Charlie Morton last year. I showed that to Charlie last year or the year before, actually, and he was uh, he was pretty blown away, too. And, and I think a lot of people say, yeah, this is like this is my favorite metal guitarist singing here. <laughs> so he's uh, he's a pretty impressive musician, and uh, that would be un- unbelievable. It's When I, when I get a, a house... My own and, and can blow it up a little bit. I'll be getting his new uh, uh, his new hundred watt amp from PRS, and I'll be letting it eat. Nice. All right. So off season concert. Oh, easy, dude. Creed. Well, Creed's on tour this year. If they're, if they're in a city and they're there, you let me know, and I'll make sure that they. Heck, we might even get you up there to play a little. I'll, get, I'll call Mark, and he'll put his foot on the guitar, and he'll start going. Ah, and you, we'll have Michael Soroka next. <laughs> That, would that be, dude's that would be a dream come true. Hey, that dude's jacked though, so you better be like in shape when you get up there, because he'll he'll have the cut off sleeves and he'll be rocking out, you know. So we'll, we'll make it happen. That would be unreal. All right, la- last one, Michael. Um, give me one thing or one person that you miss most about your Atlanta Braves days. Like, what's one you know person or joke or or just part of that org where you're like, ah, oh, I missed that. Um, you know, it's, it's always the guys, um, you know, it's the guys that you can spend every day with. And, uh, for me, uh, Ian Anderson and I got real close. Um, I lived with him every spring training at his place in, in Northport. And, um, you know, we got to spend a bit of time together and he's been going through a rehab of his own right now. So, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing him back. And, uh, I think he's him, Tim Riley and I mean Acuna are, are some of the only ones, and, and I guess Albies too that uh, have been around that whole time. And uh, I guess I can't forget AJ Minter either. He he won't be happy with me if I forget him. But um, he's uh, <laughs> they've, they, that kind of group of guys has been the group that I came up with and, and was there. Uh, those are the guys that kind of made it feel like for me. So uh, yeah, it's, it's it's always the guys for me. All right, Michael, before we let you go, I know we got into some deep stuff that Scott and Eric don't know about Alter Bridge and some, some hard rock stuff. So before I let you go, though, are you excited Game of Thrones, uh, the House of Dragons is coming back on? Because that death scene you put on is, as, you know, J- Joffrey was amazing. I mean, the way you went out was, was incredible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, uh, I get that sometimes, and I, especially I, the way I'm looking at my picture right now, I can see that too. Um, <laughs> less so when I got the beard, but I decided to go shaving this year. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I actually watched the first season. That was real good. And I actually enjoyed it more than game of Thrones. So, um, we'll see the, uh, we'll see the next one that I think it's coming out this summer. So it'll be fun. There you go. Good. Wow. This was a, this was an AJ Brzezinski roller coaster ride experience here. I mean, he's got, he's, got the, he's, got the, he's got the Adam Amin sweater on, so he's yeah. going to fit in perfectly in Chicago. He probably doesn't even know who Adam Amin is, he will. but he will. he'll find out. Great podcast. <laughs> Michael, awesome having you on. Good luck. We'll catch you at some point during the season, all right? Appreciate the time. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you always.
Thank you, Michael Soroka, joining us on FT Live. That was fun. All right. Let's get right to our next topic because then we'll have our next guest joining us in probably about five minutes. So uh, your bet MGM futures. And we're actually going to start with some clips uh, over the next couple days. So uh, we are friends with the Better Hour on the MSG network. Uh, AJ was on there. We'll show that clip probably tomorrow. I was on there and I want to bring that question to the show. So let's give you a little taste of what we talked about. All right, welcome back into the Better Half Hour. Can I hear your specials? Want to welcome in a new guest, host of Foul Territory, Scott Braun, to talk all things BetMGM baseball bets. Scott, welcome to the show, man. Alex, great to be here, and happy almost baseball season to you. Let's go. Sun is finally out in New York. Let's talk former teammates here to kick this off. Going head-to-head on the prop shop for home runs. We got Francisco Lindor. We got Jose Ramirez. If you were to go head-to-head on one of these two, which way would you lean? You know what? Lindor won the battle last year, Alex, and I'm going to stick with him again this time around. I know if you look at three-year averages, this was a low, and there we're seeing it right now for Ramirez, and this was a high for Lindor. Lindor is in my mind a much better lineup i think he can sustain more of that 30 plus homer pop that we saw from last year and for me ramirez i think still can park himself in that high 20s so i'll give a slight edge to francisco who's a year younger some better peripheral stats by a hair here and there it's close i tried to see if anyone had significant wall scrapers on one side or the other i didn't but i'm taking lindor on this one all right thoughts I like more homers this year. I'll take Lindor. I think he's going to have a big year this year. I agree. He won the battle last year between those two. I think it's a better lineup. I think you can avoid Jose Ramirez in the Cleveland Hmm. lineup, right? If you guys were game planning against Cleveland. Yeah, he's not getting anything to hit. (laughs) He's not getting nothing to hit. (laughs) Do not pitch to that guy. Everyone else? Okay. Kratz, do you... I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna say it Jose, and and really? not just to be the antagonist, but more of the fact that everybody continues to try to throw to this guy. You cannot get a fastball by him. He is his every year. His breaking ball, his batting average against breaking ball goes up, and every year he's hitting balls. He's he's up there in the league lead in doubles now those balls are going to start going over the fence. To me, the last thing that you develop as an elite hitter is how to punish breaking balls. You can hit breaking balls. He started out being able to hit heaters. He still can hit a heater, and his average on breaking balls continues to go up. Yes, he's going to get pitched around, but I see a 32 out of him, and I see about 27 from Lindor. And I agree with AJ. I think Lindor is going to have a huge year. But J Ram is a MVP candidate every single year. I think Lindor will be in that will be in that discussion, but I think Hosey gets him this year. Okay. It's a good question. You know, I was looking back and I was like, oh, Lindor, easy. And then I was like, oh wait, you know, Hosey's no. beaten him in the past. And yeah, but Lindor cool. hit how many Lindor hit last year? 30, 30 something. 32? I thought it was 32, right? The the problem 30, I have is 30? even last year. I think he was, yeah. Uh, the, the problem I have with the, the Ramirez pick is, one, he's not going to get pitched to, I don't feel enough. And, two, I remember talking to Tito, and I'm sure it'll happen with Stephen Vogt this year. He got outside of his strike zone a lot last year because he mm-hmm. knew that he had to help the team out. So there was games he did where he would swing at balls up here and down there, whereas in the past <laughs> he pretty much stayed in the strike zone. So I just worry about that a little bit unless they can find some help. I know – Naylor had a big year for him. Josh Naylor behind him last year drove in, I think, almost 100 runs or right around 100 runs and missed some time. But, you know, if if Josh Naylor doesn't have a big year, who else is in that lineup for the Guardians? I mean, Miles Straw's gone. Oh, wait. Miles Straw's not a hitter. Nolan Jones. Uh, Did you say Miles Straw? Yeah, Miles Straw is He's gone, though. He got DFA'd. Yeah, yeah. Uh, (laughs) The the other Naylor? Yeah. Bo, but I mean, he had ninth for him last year, or eighth, right, right ahead of Straw. Yeah, he's going to have to move up. <laughs> they're going to have some <laughs> offensive. There. They're going to have some offensive struggles. Yes. Andre Semenes bounce back year, maybe. Maybe. 
A heel right. hit in front of yep. Hosey. No, uh, yeah, he. Well, no, he kind of behind. He had in front and behind last year of him. I thought I he was leading off. Coming up. Who? Jimenez? Uh, no. Yeah, Andres. Not last year. Jimenez hit like fifth for him last year, sixth at times. Oh. Quan lead off. No? Quan hits lead off. Yeah. Quan. Just, I mean, you know, there, there's some dudes coming up. Like they've got a, a pretty decent farm system, even on the position player side, a little better than it's been. But if you look at their major league depth chart right now, oof, it's it's tough. Yep. I'm, I'm circling one name, and that's it. Yeah, Ramirez. That's it. I mean, that's why Naylor that's had a such a good one. year last year because he also didn't get a lot to hit. And so when he would come up, Hosey would be on base, Hosey would steal, and then Naylor would drive him in. Other than that, it was like, okay, look at their outfield production last year. It was awful. Awful. Yeah, they, they don't have much there, and they actually did give up two really good outfielders over the past year, Nolan Jones and Will Benson. So yeah. Those are two starters. Those are starters. If they were in that lineup, I'm talking about Cleveland differently this year because I like both of those players a lot. I think they felt like both of them had contact issues. Did they get a little too obsessed with contact? I don't know. That's, yeah. Anyway, uh, one more thing I wanted to hit before our next guest here, uh, NL Central. So let's check out the current odds because I'm not going with number one there. I'm sorry. So it's Cardinals favored, then the Cubs pretty close at plus 200 after the Cards plus 175, Reds plus 340, Brewers plus 750, and Pirates plus 1300. And please help us out in the chat because I think the NL Central is going to be very compact. Dude, the Cardinals are the favorite. They were awful last year. Awful. They and they've hit like of, two homers this spring. They have a lot of games to make up. <laughs> <laughs> I know spring training doesn't matter, but they hit like two homers all spring. <laughs> so that's crazy. I that don't know how they're the favorite. Stat. I don't know how they're the favorite. I, I, I Sonny Gray starting on the IL. Edmund is he? He's back, right? Not, not yet. Well, New bar's hurt, right? Ready. New bar hurt, broke New his ribs. Hurt. He's out. That, Middleton's hurt. They have a lot of injuries. They, they got. They're banged up already. We haven't even started yet. And I just don't know how they're the favorite. I mean, I, I love a lot of guys on that team. <clears throat> but to me, it's like they're the favorite. I'm like, shouldn't it be the Reds or the Cubs? I think it's a two team race. Those are the teams. The Brewers with with Williams out, trading Burns. I think they've fallen off. Uh, man, I mean, I if, can you bet against the Cardinals somehow? Yeah, they're. You way mean tall. like, well, like bet where they don't right, win the win, division? Win total. Okay, yeah. That, <laughs> Take the under on the win total, right? I just – I don't know. I just don't – and Pittsburgh is imp- going to be better than what they have been. There's a lot of optimism, obviously, being there yesterday. But I just – man, I just can't figure out how the Cardinals are the favorites. Win projections like Especially them. since I can get the Reds at plus 340. Love that. That's the spot. Hey, can I get any temptation on the defending champs in this division or even the – Pittsburgh Pirates youngsters, if O'Neill Cruz mm. has a breakout year. No, and Jared Pittsburgh's, Jones too, and Pittsburgh's a couple guys away still. Not yet. Okay. I agree. Just wondering. Brewers gave up too much. If Devin Williams is out for Half the year. a lot of time, that's going to hurt them. I know what Piamps and McGill or someone or Uribe. Piamps, McGill, Uribe. Adam going to be their closer. Relievers. Yeah. Uh, and they're good. No, they're good. But Devin Williams, was, was it was over. Yeah. And then, I mean – I think it's Reds, Cubs, and I would, yeah, I, would, I tend to lead towards Kratz here, bet on the Reds because they're the best value. And the Brewers. The Brewers, I would go win total. I'd go the over on the win total still because they figure out how to win games. Their lineup could be sneaky with some guys having a second year in the big leagues. Yelly moving into, you know, kind of a three hole hitter. Maybe he starts to drive in more runs. Last year, he's more of a leadoff hitter. Jackson Churio, there's there's too many maybes with this team to say I'm taking them to win the division. But they have proven everybody wrong, and they've missed on the win total the last six straight years. So go get you some win total, but get you plus 340 with the Reds. I'm super hyped about this division because I think it's going to be close. I just think there are a lot of teams that have similar range. I think the Pirates are going to start out hot. I don't think they're – which one? Strong. Which I know we have. Uh, Kate, hey, we got one minute. But yeah. what? 
Which division is more intriguing to you? This one, the AL West with the Mariners, Astros, Rangers. The NL West, I mean, I know the Dodgers are supposed to run away with it, but the Padres, Giants, and Diamondbacks all have cases that they could keep it close, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, which one of those – I mean, the AL Central is kind of like the NL Central. It's a mishmash of who knows what the hell is going to happen. Yeah. This one's interesting to me because I don't love any of the teams, and I think the race is for the division, and that's it. I don't think they're going to be wild card teams out of this, this division. NL West is the most exciting to me because I just think there's four pretty solid ball clubs, especially on the pitching side of things. AL West a little less because I think there's two really bad teams in the AL West, and then there's three good teams. Which one's the most exciting for you? Not like in terms of talent. We're just no, talking no, about like a race and, and just watching the whole division. For me, I feel like all of these teams in the NL Central are, are pretty close. I do. I think, yeah, I think this one, I think both centrals because there's only one team going to come out of either one. Yep. That to me is what makes it crazy. And I know the Twins are favored heavily, but I think, you know, much like the the Reds, the Royals made some big moves this offseason, right? Mm -hmm. The Tigers are supposedly better. They so are. it's going to be, you know, it's going to be interesting. I agree. All right. The first bet offer um, at 1500 is on up to 1500 paid back in bonus bets. Uh, if you don't pull off that first bet, bonus code is foul when you download the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android or visit BetMGM.com. Um, sign up and deposit at least 10 bucks into the account. Place your first wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. And if that happens, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. There's bet five, get 150 instantly if you're in North Carolina. That has arrived also when you use the bonus code FOUL, F-O-U-L. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Okay, next guest coming in, Kate Maniscalco, a.k.a. Ask Kate, joining us right now on FT Live. You might have seen some of her clips on Instagram on TikTok and other platforms. Kate, great to have you on. And I'd like for you first off to just kind of introduce what you do in the world of baseball and how you kind of found some some things on socials that you've really enjoyed doing and connecting with fans about. Yes, awesome. One, thank you guys so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Love watching the show. Um, Ask Kate was kind of started in a very traditional sense. I was at a baseball game with some of my girlfriends. I was at the Yankee game. And one of them turned to me and said, wait, what do those numbers mean on the Jumbotron? And I said, oh, okay. So I you know, explained average and hits and walks and strikeouts and stuff like that. And a light bulb kind of went off in my head. And I said, I wonder if I could use this on social media. I've been in the baseball world since I was a kid and I used to work for the Yes Network. So I started making videos explaining baseball and sports to women found a niche in that area of the field and it kind of blew up. So I explained like baseball slang, different rules that go on in Major League Baseball that people aren't really aware of. And it's kind of became my entire content strategy on social media. I have to ask because your last name, you're not related to Sebastian, are you? No, but I used to tell people that a lot just for fun. That would be no. smart right now. That would be very <laughs> right? smart right now. You do like a long lost niece or cousin or something <laughs> no i wish i did meet him though way before he blew up because he came to a really small comedy place on long island so i do have a picture with him but we're not related okay all right so then explain <laughs> explain like ask kate i get it you played softball correct in college you played softball yes, I played for, for ithaca yeah okay so then that's how you became so interested and you knew all the stats how do we get more women involved other than ask Kate to figure some of this stuff out. Cause people ask me, I go to my son's games and they're like, what's slugging percentage? What's, how do I, do I just direct them directly to you? Is that the easiest answer? Well, that's actually so funny that you bring that up because at first I really, I knew it would do well on social media, but I didn't think it would do this well. And what happened was I think a lot of the younger guys, like young kids that were playing little league were tagging their moms on TikTok, saying like, here, mom, this is the infield fly rule. So you don't have to ask all of your friends at the game. And it's funny now people will like comment and DM me. And if there's a big play or if something crazy happens, they're like, can you just break this down and explain this? Because I'm still very confused. So I think routing people to me, I can explain it and dumb it down in ways that a person that's never even watched a game in their entire life can understand. So would you say, you know, every one of the rules because I would, I think I, I do. Yes. Because we used to play a game, different teams. It didn't always hit with all the teams, but the teams where like some of the wives 
were always hanging out or the girls were always hanging out, we'd get a random text thread through and a situation would come up based on a video and the girlfriends or wives would get points based on who knew more of the more of the rules. So maybe that could be like a little like when something happens in a game, you could put it out there and people could people could engage with that. But do you think you would win that? Because then it would be bragging rights for us guys like, hey, yeah, my my wife, she she knows because my wife, my wife won a couple times, but she also has two boys at home and me watching games and you know, our daughter plays softball too. So she kind of had, yeah. she was cheating, but. I think that's actually a really good idea. I feel like I should do that with my followers on social media. I do think I would win that game. Um, it was funny, like one of the girls used one of my videos and like recorded herself talking to her boyfriend. She's like, um, do you, don't you think it's ridiculous that Jackson Holiday isn't on the opening day roster? And he just kind of looked at her like she had six heads. So it's funny watching the girls on social media use things that I say in my clips to tell their boyfriend or their guy friends or any of their friends about things that are happening in the game. I love it. So let's kind of do an ask Kate here. Can you run us through maybe a rule of the day? Yeah. So rule of the day, I found this First of all, and I feel like a lot of social media networks didn't even know this either. Uh, it was Francisco Lindor. He was called for obstruction in spring training. Oh, shit. Second- oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to foul territory. I agree Kate. with you. <laughs> I agree with you. But people were tweeting out going, oh, look at this new rule that MLB is enforcing. And I sat there. I'm like, I don't really think this is a new rule. So I do some research. I do some digging. Obstruction has been around always in Major League Baseball, you can't block the bag. But apparently MLB sent out a letter to all of the umpires and all of the managers this year and saying they're really going to harp down on this. They're going to make it super strict. So they're on high alert that any plays at second, any plays at third base, those fielders cannot block any part of the bag if they do not have the ball. And the reason it gets a little bit fishy, though, is you can make the argument that, well, Lindor is in the process of receiving the ball, so he should be able to to, you know, put his knee down or block the bag or do whatever he can so that the runner can't come into the base. It's dumb. It's just dumb. It's just dumb. Listen, you're going to block the base, you're going to get run over. It's the way it should. But, you know, what what, what do we know? Kate knows all. We know nothing. You know, it's like. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) That's how you really feel. No, I'm serious because that, like, that went, that did go crazy because he was just Mm -hmm. catching a throw. The guy was out by, like, five feet. And he just tags him. Everyone, even the runners, like I'm out, no big deal. And then the umpire's like, "No, nope, I'm going to put an up show on." Nope, he's safe because his foot blocked the corner of the base. Like it's just, it's, it's going to be. There's someone's going to get. There's going to be a nasty ejection because of that rule early in the year, and and it's going to be good. We're going to talk about it here, Kratz. Do you agree? Oh, I completely agree. It's a terrible rule, but I was on the board that that voted against the whole not being able to run over catchers. So I, as a catcher, I was totally for still being able to run over, but that's a complete other discussion that we'll have another time. What's your go-to rule? If you have, let's say, like a really ugly big league veteran of 19 years and a really handsome minor league big league veteran of 19 years, what would be the rule that you would go and stump us with? That you're like, I bet you Neanderthals do not know this rule. <laughs> Ooh, an older rule. I don't know if I could really stump anyone. I will say one that I've explained recently was when a fielder say, you know, the ball is hit in foul territory. It's a deep, deep fly ball. And a fielder, you know, just drops the ball because there's a runner on third base. A lot of people would say like, well, why wouldn't he just catch the ball? The whole rule being that that's not a rule, but that the runner could just tag up even if he catches the ball foul. That was a big one that I did on social media. I don't know if I could really stump the older generation because they, I think, know their stuff a little bit better than me. I'm just good at simplifying it. But I think that's a rule that did well on social media that I recently did. Okay. So speaking of that, I've I've had this asked to me plenty of times. Sacrifice fly. Runner on third, one out. Okay. Sack fly, the left fielder, let's say he's catching it. And people are like, oh, he has to catch it before the runner can leave. And I'm yeah. like, no, he, all he has to do is touch it. Because people are like, why wouldn't you just bounce, juggle it and run it all the way in and then the runner can't score? And I'm like, no, because that's why they have to touch it and then you can go. Because otherwise, like, the outfitter could just, like, 
you know, like hit it with his glove and then, oh, I'm in the infield. Now I catch it. Not, you know what I'm saying? So that was a big one for me. The people ask me that all the time. Like, I don't understand the sack fly rule. They have to wait because, you know, sometimes you see guys juggle it and the guy will leave early. And they're like, you know, they feel it. And he's like, no, as soon as it touches it. So I don't know. That, 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 that probably would have stumped Kratz. No, for sure. And then even like, it's, I think it's the first part that touches the glove, right? So a lot of people say like, why wouldn't you just, you know, move your glove down so you catch it lower, give them more time to throw the ball. But that, that is a big one for sure. Yes, for sure. How about this one? Now, this isn't, we're, trying, we're not trying to stump Kate, but I just went over, I just went over that one the other day in our practice for high school. So because we were working on tagging from third base. AJ's team, they don't need to work on tagging from third base. They just hit dingers. We have to work on the basic stuff. Let's say it's a base is loaded because this happened in when this happened in Little League. Little League World Series. Base is loaded. Infield fly. Infield fly is called. The ball lands fair and goes to bounce foul. And the pitcher, the pitcher picks it up before it bounces foul. If he had let it go foul, would it have been a infield fly batters out because it landed fair, but then rolled foul in front of the base, or would it have been a would it have been a a, a foul ball? Would it have been fair or foul? So the ball's in the air. They call, immediately call infield fly. Right. Nobody touches it, and then it rolls foul. Yes. I feel like that's a foul ball then, because nobody touched it's it. Foul. It's a foul ball, but what if the kid fields it on the bounce before it goes foul? Oh, then it's fair. Is it foul? Fair. No, it's, it's fair. It's fair. Oh, yeah. Fair. You got it. I was getting a little nervous there. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting quizzed well, on the show. Yeah, the, the delivery, because I can say this, because we all just give each other shit all day. The delivery of that. Yeah, that question I had to was, follow. I had to really follow that one. Was uh, that was that was confusing? SATs for me. All right. So, Kate, I do have a question. <laughs> I have asked big league umpires this, and I want to know your opinion on this. Okay. Say there's a say there's a timeout, okay? And I'm the, I'm a runner on second base. There doesn't you know one out. Let's say there's one out. Ooh. They call yeah. timeout, okay? And they go meet on the mound, and I'm the base runner, and I go over to third base to talk to my third base coach, okay? What's to stop me as the runner? from just starting like a foot away from third base when the pitcher gets the ball and gets on the rubber? Why can't I be like, this is my lead, pick me off. And the guy comes set and you just step on third and then you're on the next base. What, what's to stop me from doing that besides getting drilled the next to bat? I, was, I, I feel like that's a very clear thing that you can do in that situation. So are you talking about like when you're going back to second base after they call okay, timeout? Yeah. So they call timeout. I go over, talk to third base coach. I walk back to second. And then I just slowly walk my way. Pitcher gets the ball. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, two feet from third base. And the, and the pitcher's looking at me. And I'm like, yeah. And, he, and he's like, and I'm like, that's my lead. What yeah. are you going to do? And if he, if he makes a motion, you just step on third. And then I'm on third with one out. You can do that. I don't know. And I've asked big league I umpires. They don't know the answer. But I figured – Kate might know the answer because they don't know. They're like, I don't know. No one's ever tried it. I think you have to go all the way back to the, would you have to go all the way back to the bag and then start? And then when they say, well, no, because you're right. That doesn't make sense because they could just go off. No, I think that's the rule. I think that's the rule, Kate. I think you have to retouch. Technically, you have to retouch the base. So my question to that is, why couldn't you just stand on third base and as soon as the ball's put in play, would you not be safe? I think someone needs to try that in Major League Baseball, see if they get if they get caught. There's for a that. player show. Ask them. Show? Yeah, you didn't announce your retirement yet. So but no, but you. okay. So okay, let's say I have to, to retouch. I, I've been on second base and I've been like standing there and they're you're talking to the shortstop and blah blah blah. And the pitcher's like, okay, and the pitching coach, I never touch the base again. Just I don't, I'm, you know, I'm like this far off the base. I don't know. I don't go back intentionally and go. Okay, I touched the base. No one's watching you that closely. Like they're going to call nope. up to New York and be like, we appeal that he didn't touch second again. No one's watching you that close. Just, you know, the pitching coach leaves. You start a second. You just slowly start walking to third like, oh, I didn't know. I didn't realize it. And then the pitcher looks up. and Because when is the ball? The ball's in play when? When he, the umpire says it's in play? Why can't I be like, this is my lead? Because you have to retouch the base. But I already did that. When I, then I walked to third. Then you walked. Yeah, but it was a dead ball then. 
So once the ball's yeah. put back in play. So I have to be on the base when the pitcher's on the rubber? If, the way I understand nope, so that it, doesn't no, no. If it gain, if it gains an advantage, you have to retouch the base. Oh, the advantage was my speed and my leads. <laughs> so that that was already, that rule doesn't exist. Your you intelligence. I trust me. I thought about it. I, my last year, I was never on base, so I couldn't really try it out. Um, I, I've got I've got one more my career. I was from from Travis, and this might be more of a shot at umpires, but we can still kick it around for fun. Travis asked yeah. if we can help to explain a check swing. And I actually think that's a great topic because some people that I've tried to, you know, kind of teach baseball will ask like, Oh, well, this ump seems to have a different perception of that check swing as this ump. And I'm like, that is correct. <laughs> like that, that's what you see in major league games all the time. I'm like, probably the, besides balls and strikes, the, the number one ejection causer, number one reason why you get people knocked out of games at this point. Yeah. I mean, the rule is that it, when it crosses the plate, like that would be a check swing to get called on for a strike. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So when it crosses the plate, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of times when people say, oh, this umpire has a completely different understanding of a check swing is then when they slow it down. I mean, oftentimes he hasn't even crossed the plate at all. Like it's just kind of coming off of his shoulder. So, but yeah, that is something that a lot of people get riled up with on social media. I mean, you guys always say what? Check with the first base ump? We always want him to check. Adrian Beltre, I remember he used to point before. Or the base umps. But yeah. that's why I was always told to use a black bat because it doesn't doesn't show you going this far. <laughs> oh, yeah. We did go over that. Fun little fact. So I always used a black bat my whole career because I was like, if I check swing, the umpire can't see it because it's night and it's black. It's like Batman. Was that really why? And you put yes. pine bar on your bat. I did not. I used a stick all the time. Never used pine tar. <laughs> well, Kate, this was fun. Appreciate you coming on. Love to do this again, obviously, as some rules come up during the season and get dicey. So you can follow Kate at Ask Kate. Um, Kate, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, awesome. Thank you guys so much for having uncle, me. Kate. <laughs> and I can't wait to see your uncle in, live and in person. Thank you. <laughs> Just tell him I only need like four tickets. Not a big deal. She's got you. I'll, I'll give it my best. Thank you guys so much. Have a good one. <laughs> Thank you. You too, Kate. Cheers. Appreciate it. All right. Um, and I did see a fan question in the super chat. Uh, Daniel, I will get to that in slap hands. But before we get to slap, we do have one more segment. And it is, that's what he said. And it is. <laughs> A new seg, new little intro. Nice. Okay. Did you guys see the quotes from the owner of the Seattle Mariners? <laughs> no. Okay. No, I did. You did? Okay. So I'm going to start with him saying a breakdown of the Mariners moves. Okay. This is the long one. I think the fans understandably reacted to some decisions that we made early in the offseason. To be clear, the decisions are Jerry DePoto and Justin Hollander's decisions. I'm going to step away from the quote for a sec. Those are the two people that run the front office for the Mariners. They listen to their boss, John Stanton. Okay, back to the quote. I approve them in most cases, but our baseball guys make those decisions. The decisions we made was we had some players who had contracts for the 2024 season that weren't going to be able to contribute to the team on the field. I think Robbie Ray walks on water. I'm a huge fan of Evan White. I think those are great people, and I'd love to have them associated with the team. But Robbie had Tommy John surgery, and the only thing I know for sure about Tommy John surgery is that the recovery takes longer than you think it's going to. We knew that Tommy John was probably going to keep Robbie out at least through July, maybe August. So now we're in a position where we've got, frankly, $23 million associated with a guy who isn't going to be able to contribute four to six months of the season. Evan, similarly. So we made a decision to take players off the roster and have the payroll, in effect, replaced by guys like Garver and Polanco. And we're going to have, with a higher, call it the same payroll. It's a slightly higher payroll, as I said, but with a similar payroll, we're going to have more productivity in all of the analytics that both we and the third parties do would suggest that we're a better team in 24 than in 23. 
he, he spoke earlier, I guess, about, quote, we didn't trim the payroll. Right now, the payroll is slightly above what it was last year. That's what we expect the payroll to be. It was an account, Simply Seattle, that posted estimated 24 payroll at 139 mil, estimated uh, 23 payroll, final payroll at 140. So that could tick up a little. I mean, I think the point, if we're talking semantics here. It's basically the same per- payroll this year and last year. So to me, it sounds like he's going, I don't do shit. That's that's Jerry and Justin. They're Dude, the I got 54% of that. That's all I got out of yep. that. Analytics at the, at the buzzer of that quote, too. Oof. Seattle is heated right now. Heated. And they should be. This team better put up dubs. They're going to have a ton of pressure. They better put up a ton of dubs, and they better be a playoff team, or that city is going to lose its mind. And there is one person to blame, and that is the person that runs the team, that gives the budget to the front office. Tell me I'm wrong here, but did the guy who told the people that work for him to cut payroll or to keep it in the same place just say, it's not me, it's them? Yes. He didn't. He didn't, he didn't tell them to cut payroll. He didn't tell them he could spend any more either. And so technically he didn't cut payroll. Like you can't blame me because it's the exact same, maybe a little bit more, but you know what? It's not my fault. I love, I love it when, when people in higher positions, he hired this guy and now he's like, Hey, Hey, I could be under siege here, right under the bus. See you, Jerry. I mean, uh, what listen, do you got? They're cheap. That's it. <laughs> what else you want to say there? I want you to say, hey, the owner should come out and say, listen. But they don't. I'm scared about the TV they don't. money and they this don't. and that. Some which... of them do, but they most of them don't. They have excuses. They can put it on someone else. Just and we did. also don't know how. We also don't know how, how involved is this guy in the how, I mean, really, how involved is he? How many other things does he have going on? Well, he's involved in the payroll. He's not necessarily. Of course. He's not but so is, so is Liberty Media, who owns the Braves. Everyone, but, everyone but they have a million other things. That's the price. My point is. Why can't you, he go to $150 million? Think how much they could. If they could have traded Robbie Ray, they got 54% return. And then they throw, you know, <laughs> if I would have looked at them, I'm like, okay, we can add 54% to the payroll, then we could win 54% of the games. They could have added Otani or Soto and not even been a top 10 payroll in the sport. I agreed. I know. But they didn't. They did. Because they're smart. What? Because their tell analytics you they're say. Yeah. Did you like that part at the end? The analytics say? I mean, listen, I get analytics, but like analytics shouldn't drive your organization to a point where it can affect your wins and losses. Like it's a piece of it. And I get it. And even like the Astros, you know, when they back in the day and the A's, you know, who never won anything with their whole money ball thing, but like the Astros, even with what they did. Yeah. They were like analytics, but there were also people like, if, you know, again, if you read Evan Drellick's book that were fighting against it, saying like, yeah, analytics are a piece, but not the total piece. And even Jim Crane has come off of that. Right. Jim Crane's like, I'll spend what I need to spend to win. And that was kind of the model, right? And all, if you look around, Luno, Luno, you know, he's got Elias. He's got all these guys that are all over the league running teams now. But at the end of the day, if the team spends, they're usually pretty good. Mm-hmm. And if the team doesn't spend, guess what they are? They're not very good usually. Yeah. Or I you mean, have now, to tank for six years. Or you have to tank forever, and then you become the Orioles. Sure. And then you're like, okay, if we need to get over that hump, guess what we have to do? We have to bring in a Corbin Burns. We might have to go get Jordan Montgomery. We might have to spend a little bit to keep these guys here because guess what? If – Think about in six years from now, if they lose Rushman, Henderson, Holiday, all these guys are gone and they didn't win anything. Fans are going to be like, why in the hell didn't we keep them? Why are we going to support another seven year rebuild? Like, that's, you got to spend something eventually. You got to be smart about that it. right now. The White Sox did that, that tank city for five years to build up. And it was like, it was like the, the fastest date ever. And then you're back to the bottom. Yeah, because they didn't get their GM got fired. And now the new GM gets five years to rebuild. Who we're going to talk to tomorrow, by the way. Yeah, we are going to have Chris Getz on tomorrow. I'm not coming on, though. Yes, you are. But can we get some accountability one time, Kratz? Hey, sorry, fans. I cut the payroll. Or I kept it the hey, same. You, I know you, we were tanking for Fisher a while. Fisher says that, and you don't like him? He doesn't say that. Yeah, he does. What do you mean he didn't say that? He came out and said, <laughs> we're, not only did I cut the payroll, we're moving. You're like, sell the team, damn it. Yeah. What? You think that's because he spoke? That I'm mad? No, I'm just saying you asked where the owner speaks. It says he's moving the team and cutting the payroll. 
You know, tells the truth. You're mad at him. Now you're mad at a guy for not. Which one do you want? Well, now, first of all, you know, we're not, we want you to say good things, but we're not going to tell you which one to say. Which one is it? They're, they're, they're closing up the parking lots because it's that's, going to, that's, that's, that's funny. fucked up. That's, that's we'll, funny. We'll, we'll get to that tomorrow. That's that's funny. Okay. But my thing is, this looks so, the optics are so bad. Whether whoever made the cuts, whoever payroll isn't higher, is lower, whatever it is, to me, that's semantics. You just hosted the All-Star game. You don't host the All-Star game and go into debt. Teams aren't looking like, man, I hope I don't get to host the All-Star game. Teams don't look at the fact that, oh, man, you know, I know I locked up my center fielder for the future and he's an MVP candidate and we just locked up our shortstop and we have one of the best catchers in the game behind the dish. You know what? I know our pitching staff's really good, but we're not going to add anything. Like, this is not my time to win. It just looks brutal to the fan base. Brutal. There, I'm, I'm typing this as, as I'm listening to you. I'm not asking to Seattle to have a $300 million payroll, but it's at $140. they are keeping so much of the money to themselves. Is, is there a team? At a time period there, when it's their winning window. Is there a team that if they would have added a player, now that now that the Orioles got Burns, they addressed the need that they had, is there a team that if they would add a if they would have added a player that would have moved higher up on the list to complete what they have on this team, other than the Mariners right now? <laughs> Your delivery today is I'm so confused about what he just asked. Wait, but I, I understand Kratz language. Okay. There is no Stronger move this past offseason than if a team like Seattle traded for Juan Soto. Thank you, Ipe. Thank you, my interpreter. <laughs> I got you. Now give me all your money. Yeah, I was going to say, you have access to his <laughs> bank accounts? And the password they had picked is... up Juan Soto, was there a team that you needed the same thing Juan about Soto the Yankees, more? though, too. Same thing about the Yankees, though, too. Yankees need a Juan Soto more than anybody. I think the Mariners have a significantly better starting staff. Yes. And the Yankees are Both almost end. always contending. They're almost always in playoff range. Oh. The Mariners didn't make the playoffs for over two decades. And they finally made it one time a couple years ago. And then they were like, that was cute. Now we're going to kind of hang here in this mid-100s range and just profit our asses off. And fans are heated. I'm telling you, they're heated. I can't sleep at night and I'm scrolling through comments after those comments come out from the owner and they are losing their minds. They think they have the worst owner in sports. And I, I actually had to remind a couple of them that that's not true, but I understand where you're coming from. <laughs> right. <laughs> Go South. See you at fans fest. They've got it worse. You still have a team, but it is not fair. It's not right. That's all. C can I get 175, 180? Really, they should be a two hundred million dollar payroll. You have team. access to Crouch's bank accounts. You can get whatever you want now. I would love to. I would love to. So, uh, Jacob said to the M's trade for Soto at the, the deadline. No, he's on the Yanks. If, if you think the Yanks are out of it by the deadline, I guess. But no, they're trying to keep nope. him long term. It, it just sucks. That's all. It sucks. <sighs> all right, let's get to slap hands. <laughs> Trivia question. What time is tomorrow's show? No? What well, time? For the you podcast tell me what audience. Time? The listening audience. One o'clock. Eastern. Mm. One to three Eastern. FT Live. Tomorrow. We're back at one o'clock. For the rest of the year. And then Thursday will be, I think, the true beginning of the FT network because you have fair territory at 1230 foul territory right after that at one until three Dodgers territory picks up at three and goes till around 330. So you will have, what is that? 1230 to 330. It's like three hours, three God. hours, three whole hours of coverage <laughs> on the pathway to um, 24. <laughs> Presenty from Four to seven. Hmm. A.M. You don't want to give me my own show. 
<laughs> White Sox territory? No. Mm-mm. I'm so, only allowed to say good things about the White Sox. Tomorrow, we will have the leader of the White Sox front office, Chris Getz, joining us. That's why I'm not show. coming on. I'm only allowed to say good things about the White Sox. I can't wait for it. Kratz hats? Florida Panthers. I'm sorry, not Florida. Carolina Panthers. Aren't those Panthers colors? Yeah. Those are still Panthers colors. Close. Uh, They went more light blue now, right? Or baby blue. Yeah. They used to be more of that teal. It's like like more like the old Marlins colors, it looks like. Mm. Yeah. That's fair. New Haven. New Haven. New Haven Ravens. I still can't get over it. It looks like a wave. It looks like a wave. Like, I get it. I get it. There's a raven in there, but it's not. Eh. From the long distance, it looks too. like a seagull. Because the nose is kind of like thin, so you can't see it. It looks like a seal. Yeah. New uh, Haven seals. Yeah. I don't get it. I don't. Why are they the ravens? I don't get it. C minus. Haven? Do they have? Do they have ravens? In New Haven. I don't know. Edgar Allan Poe would be more like the Baltimore Ravens. They're purple. They're purple, right? Great. C minus mm. for me. I played again. I played there. Yeah. C minus. Yeah, it's good. Nice. They have good pizza. <laughs> C in minus. Haven, yeah, it's good. <laughs> oh, I forgot about the super chat. Hold on, Daniel, with a super chat question. Since the commissioner represents owners now more than ever, should we have a new commissioner that rules down the middle? Won't have it. He's paid by the owners. But in the, he's paid by the owners in the CBA. Doesn't matter. Be he's paid by the owners. He's the owners. owners. Tony Clark, Rob Manfred, <laughs> car crash. I have a question. Should there be the dude that reps the players, the dude that reps the owners, like the CEO, whatever you want to call it, and then someone that deals more with discipline, rules, all of that? Why is that the same as the dude who represents the billionaire money stuff? You know what I'm saying? Doesn't it make more sense so you if you restarted it? Well, for the, for the rules, like for the game, just the game stuff, not worrying about the money portion, you know, not worrying about fighting over how large the salary cap slash luxury tax should be and no. what service time should look like. It's not going to happen. You, you can think of it, but it's not going to happen because the owners own, the players play, they're employees of the owners. The owners make the rules. The owners can do whatever they want, basically. That's why they had to form a union. And that's why there's strike. And that's why, because sometimes the owners try to overexert. Sometimes the players want more. Boom, again, car crash. Back in the day, there was not free agency. There was not free, there wasn't and, arbitration, there wasn't free agency, there wasn't shit. You were stuck. And that's, and we are not, in the sense of like business and like generations of money, we're not that far from that. I know years wise, like it's been 40, was it 70, was it 70 something that they came up with free agency or was it 80 something? So we're 30, we're still only 30 to 40 years await since that happened so to me nothing like that's gonna change until we get somebody exactly like daniel said who's more in the middle somebody that can what year 75 players won the right to free agency in 1975 okay so we're almost 50 years then kurt flood right Mm -hmm. so you sit there and you go like you need you need to me that's the best for the game. If you have somebody making decisions that understands the future and how owners want to make money, players want to make money and how that happens, yes, that would be better for the game. It 100% would. Will it happen? Just like AJ said, once until there's not declared two sides and they have to feel like they're fighting against each other every 6 years. It will never happen. Let's not forget, we're not that far away from... I mean, I remember when guys had roommates in the big leagues. They didn't get their own rooms. In the bigs. I think it was the 94 strike when that changed. It was around then when that changed. They were like, guys had roommates. What if your roommate is the world's worst snorer? Then you try to find a new roommate. Oh. But no, like guys had roommates. I remember talking to guys and they were like, we had in the big leagues. Not in the minor leagues. Minor leagues, we all had roommates. No, I'm the world's worst snore. That was oh, you that was me. That's how I was. That's how I got my own room in the minor leagues. 
just snore a couple yeah. times and nobody wants to room with you. <laughs> yeah, because I'm the world's lightest sleeper. So I would just be Raven if I was roomed with Kratz. You'd be a New Haven, be be a new haven Raven. I'd be a New Haven Raven. It all comes together. <laughs> Wednesday, 1 o'clock Eastern, Foul Territory. If you like this shirt or you need a hoodie because it's still cold, Foul Territory Shop. Dot com subscribe to the channel join as a member all that stuff okay i don't do shameless plugs that often so don't at me well you, you definitely don't say subscribe enough so please subscribe it's free there you go ken rosendahl actually does it best at the end of fair territory Maybe see you wednesday learn with something chris from getz gm of the white Sox. i do every day i read his article yeah, but you should learn something on how to host <laughs>